ックストリーム Yes, I know. It's been six months since my last review, and the review request list has been slowly building up. And so, as I'm doing videos more infrequently these days, I figured I would start to group a few films together per video in an effort to cut down on the wait for people who watch my channel. And I have several requests from the same person. So, let's try and make a dent in this to do list, shall we? I'm going to be calling this video the Freddy vs. Mario Quadruple Smackdown. And kicking off this video is the 1958 sci fi horror ish film, It, The Terror from Beyond Space. As with most films of this type and this era, the movie is about an hour long, and for the first 30 minutes, nothing happens. The story is the first expedition to Mars goes up, and then Mission Control lose contact. And finally, when a rescue ship appears, there's only one dude left. And oh my god, it's Major Jeff from Fiend Without a Face. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. But it, it's incredible. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. <laughs> Priceless comment, Jeff. Absolutely priceless. Let's watch that again. The entire spinal cord is missing. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. Major Cummings had the best explanation so far. Mental vampire. That's rubbish. So they're all on their way back to Earth, and the new crew all thinks that Jeff killed everybody. But it soon becomes apparent. To us, at least, anyway, that he didn't, and it's some evil monster that killed them. And surprise, surprise, it's now also aboard the new ship going back to Earth. Now, with movies like this, you're supposed to expand on your characters because they're all trapped together on a spacecraft with nowhere to go and no escape. So it's vital that we actually give a shit about these people if and when they get killed. But, as you may have already guessed, barely any of them get any characterization, so you don't care when they die. Oh, yeah, smart move, dumbass. Discharging a firearm in a pressurized place like a spacecraft. That won't kill everybody. But this was the 50s, so they're allowed to not know anything about space and the universe. So, what else have you got as a plan to take out the creature? Grenades? What did I just say about pressurized places? <sighs> Whatever. And the alien isn't even dead anyway. And from this point onward, to me, the film is incredibly boring, as all they try and do is get supplies for sick crew members and try to devise ways of killing the creature to no avail. Also, the sound on my copy of the film started to go out of sync by a few seconds, but that's probably just my own technical issues. Also, this may be a bit petty, but they use the same shot of the rocket flying in space a baker's dozen times. And of course, there has to be some form of love interest for our main man, Jeff. You and, and him just out of nowhere. Couldn't have put it better myself, mate, because there's been no connection between them at all in the film whatsoever. So they hide out on the top deck, and when it comes through the last door, it gets stuck. And then they blast open an airlock, making the alien suffocate. Oh, check out this quality shot of the suit actor getting twatted in the head by a box. Bosh! And that's it. The end. Three out of ten. Right, my next film in this list is Beast from the Haunted Cave. There's two random guys in a car taking photos. And it looks like it's going to be set in a ski resort, maybe. And. Oh no. I'd recognize that intro music anywhere. It's the same tune used in that shit fest, Attack of the Giant Leeches. A movie I fucking despised back in the day when I reviewed it three years ago. And then, bam, 
into the most epic credits you'll ever see. It's not really epic, it's crap. Look! And no surprise, this is produced by Gene Corman, who happens to be Roger Corman's brother. I really should lay off the hate on Roger, because sometimes his movies make me laugh. But other times, I just can't help being pissed off at him because he's produced and directed some truly shocking pieces of crap that I've ever had the unfortune to witness. Anyway, let's get started with this crap. Long story short, some guys are learning to ski to do a cross-country ski thing at a ski resort. Ski used three times in one sentence. But also, there's something to do with mentioning putting charges into a gold mine. None of the characters held my interest, and I didn't care at all about them. We learn nothing about these people. All they seem to do is talk about pointless crap and get drunk. The first 15 minutes are just total filler crap before anything happens. So some guy and a chick go to this abandoned gold mine and he puts explosives down when she's not looking and then a monster appears and presumably kills her but we don't see her die or see the monster. But oh yeah, he gets out alive without a scratch. <laughs> Fantastic way to deal with someone in shock. Just throw them out the door and beat them up. Priceless. The editing in this film is extraordinarily bad. Check this out. Natalie. You the girl that works in the bar? You took that girl. Now, I know what you're thinking. James, stop being a dickhead. It's a low-budget 1950s movie. It's not going to be amazing. And to that, I say, I have to fucking agree. A film can be as shit as it likes, but the only things I ask for is to A, give a shit about the characters, and B, for the editing not to be... bollocks. This movie fails at both of them. And why the hell would you sleep on the ground in a mountainous region, below freezing at night, without even so much as a tent to cover you, no less? Could the production crew not even afford a tent? <sighs> hell, just rent one! Jesus Christ, there's nobody trying for any realism here. I... don't even know what's going on here. I love random pointless moments in films, and here's one of them. It doesn't even seem to fit. And I love how the ominous music plays and yet fuck all is happening and they're just skiing by. man was that it we've waited 46 minutes to see a monster and that was it that is the biggest letdown blah 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 you know the template for stories like this bad guys are evil good guys are good and win the woman at the end the monster looks like crap and shit blows up some people get eaten by the creature who knows what the hell it is How do they know? Uh, I've got an idea. Maybe he just heard them screaming a few seconds ago. So our hero shoots the creature a few times, and then the rest of the baddies come in, and they get killed, and the monster gets set on fire and dies. And then there's an abrupt Godfrey Ho Ninja movie-esque ending. The end. 
In summary, this film was just mega boring and nothing happens for 45 minutes. Two out of ten. Next. Silent Night, Bloody Night. This movie starts talking about some old dude and he dies on fire for no reason I can think of and screaming randomly. But I did laugh. In fact, I laughed quite a few times in this movie because of the editing and the random ominous music and abrupt cuts to the next scene. Well, at least you can't fault people for wanting to get to the point. That is the best cut ever. You're chilling watching a movie and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of old people are just randomly staring at you. I mean, I'm not editing this badly to make it look shit. This is how it is. The long and short of the film at this point is some house is up for sale, some people want to buy it and other people want it torn down. Oh, come on, dude. Don't kill a dog. This meeting room scene is absolutely hilarious. These people are so miserable, the cuts are so random, and an old man pressing a desk bell for no reason at random intervals. The only thing missing is the staring music from Manos the Hands of Fate. So, cutting through all the boring, the lawyer selling the house and his mistress spend the night there, and then the killer turns up and murders them. Wouldn't it be funny after all that if the killer opened the wrong door? And they made no attempt to escape, they just rolled around soaking up the hits from the axe blade. Whatever. Aha! Now I suspect that this car thief here is the killer after we saw him at the start going ape shit and smashing a car because he's broken down. Also, the killer escaped from a mental hospital, so it very may well be him. Yeah, smart lass pointing a gun at the scary nut job. And he's a sarcastic bastard too. When she says a maniac has escaped, and it could be him, she asks for his ID. California license. Lucky you. Would you like to see my maniac card from the asylum? They give you one when you escape. There's a big scarlet M on it so people won't get confused. That is probably the worst footage ever taken from a car that I've ever seen. I can do better with a shit old phone that takes video footage in 0.3 megapixels. Check this out. So the sheriff dies and takes a shovel to the face. So the nut job and the old man with the desk bell go off to find some old lady named Tess. But she's at the old house and she dies. Check out this masterful editing. The person on the telephone said 1935. Christmas Eve. This lady reads an old newspaper and it tells us more about the family that owned the house and what the hell is actually going on. The crazy guy reappears and they go back out to look for the old bell guy and hilariously run him over. But not before finding his burning car. And watch this, this is my favourite piece of camera work in the entire film. It's empty. It's like amateur footage of a bonfire in someone's back garden filmed on somebody's phone. 
and uh, then the nut job sits down and reads a book that his granddad wrote, which actually, as it turns out, his granddad is also his dad, and the house was a mental asylum for a bit, and his granddad lets the crazy people go out because of guilt, and bugger me, how many people were they keeping in that shed? It's a rather overly long flashback, and the patients kill the asshole doctors who treated them like crap. Great. But this doesn't tell us who the killer is. At all. It all just confused me. And then there's a fucking Macbeth-style ending, and everybody dies. The random lady does the end narration, and the credits roll. Whatever. Four out of ten. But that's only because of the appalling editing and hilariously crap acting and camera work. Take those away, and it's two and a half. All right, we're on to the last one of the video. Film number four, Horror High, also known as The Twisted Brain, or whatever the hell. So this begins by showing us a geek riding his bike to school, and because he handed the wrong homework into his teacher, the paper he spent all summer on gets chopped up. What a bitch! Then a cat starts randomly attacking a guinea pig in the science lab, and he chases the cat away with a broom. What a hero this guy is. Why does anyone need a broom to get rid of a cat? Then the caretaker comes along, and I swear if I didn't know better, this guy could have been the precursor to Mr. Filch. All the adults are dicks to this guy, and, whoa, if this chick likes you, mate, then you're not doing that badly. And now there's locker room douchebaggery going on. Okay, movie, we get it. Nobody likes him. So later at night, when the geek breaks into the school, he finds out his formula on the guinea pig worked, and it killed the caretaker's cat. But then the old guy thinks the geek did it. So he bashes the guinea pig to death with a torch, and makes the geek drink the formula. <laughs> What's the matter with him? Doesn't sound like he's being sick. He sounds more like he's orgasming to me. So the geek beats the caretaker up, and... oh. What are you doing? Just jump in the shower, you pillock. And I don't even have to mention how fucking stupid and dangerous it is to have a barrel of industrial-grade sulfuric acid in a fucking school. But what do I know? So we have a classic moment when the body is discovered, and then the cops turn up to investigate, and... Oh my god, I fucking hate that English teacher. She reminds me of an English teacher I had. Oh good, she's about to die. <laughs> that was so unstealthy, I love it. Why don't you come by my house? Here, I'll write down the address. Oh, I know where you live. You do? I, I, I looked it up once. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I even wrote your phone number down in my notebook. <laughs> oh, Vernon, that came across as so stalkery. What's worse is you know her number, too, but she thinks nothing of it. I guess the 70s were different times. If you said that to a girl now, you'd probably get pepper sprayed and probably jailed for some unknown reason. Wait, what? You're killing the PE coach now? What for? All he wanted is a football player to copy off your science test, and he was going to give you a free pass to skip PE for the whole year. And you're killing him. That's low, man. Cue the tash wiggle. Why does no one put up a fight? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the cops keep popping up from time to time, because they're trying to catch the killer. Oh, come on, dude. How fucking dumb are you? The geek is the killer. The girl's douchebag ex-boyfriend is suspected to be the killer, but he's let out on account of lack of evidence. So he goes to set a trap for our main man, but she turns up to warn him and finds out that he is actually the killer. Ooh, horror cliche there. And then, and then there's another dragged out chase scene. The douchebag gets killed by the geek, then the cops turn up and shoot him dead. 
okay, that was um, anticlimactic and cut short. Oh well, five out of ten. I'll be back soon. Look out for more multiple film review videos in the future.